All right, class, this is chapter 15. It's going to cover uh, caring for respiratory emergencies. <clears throat> All right, the objectives for chapter 15. Number one is going to be a review of the respiratory anatomy and physiology from chapter four. Objective two, we're going to define the following terms. Accessory muscles, asthma, bronchitis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD, cyanosis, dyspnea, emphysema, hypercarbia, hyperventilation, hypoxia, respiratory compromise, respiratory distress, respiratory failure, tripod position, wheezing, Number three, explain common causes of respiratory compromise. Number four, describe the signs and symptoms of a patient experiencing respiratory compromise. Number five, explain the pathophysiology of a respiratory compromise. Number six, describe the appropriate assessment and care of a patient experiencing respiratory compromise. Number seven, demonstrate the ability to appropriately assess and care for a patient experiencing respiratory compromise. Number eight, recognize the fear that a respiratory emergency can cause. Number nine, value the importance of reassurance when caring for a patient with a respiratory emergency. <clears throat> All right, overview of respiratory anatomy. Respiratory drive is controlled by the respiratory control center found in the brain's medulla. This is gonna control the rate and the volume Alright, the upper airway. I'm right, going to start with the nasopharynx. This is a pathway of oxygen or just the air we're breathing, which has got about 21% oxygen in it. In the upper throat from the nose to the mouth. Oropharynx. This is the pathway for oxygen or the air we breathe in the throat from the mouth to the larynx. Vocal cords. This is a separate structure of the upper and lower airway. Our lower airway, uh, trachea, oxygen, or the air we breathe, uh, can pass from the larynx to the lungs. Carina, where the trachea splits into right and left main stem bronchi. <clears throat> the reason I uh, keep making sure everybody's aware that when they're saying oxygen pathway, they're actually referring to the air you're breathing in and out it's not only oxygen it's uh like i said about 21 percent oxygen about 79 percent nitrogen there's some other trace gases in there but for all practical purposes the air we breathe in is about 21 percent oxygen 79 percent nitrogen all right the lower airways the bronchioles these are the smallest oxygen pathways into the lungs. Alveoli. This is the uh, <clears throat> site of oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. Um, I'll try to bring in some type of lung and trachea that we can look at in the next class. Um, it's really cool to see how they actually work and how everything goes. We'll see what I can work out. All right, this is just an overview of the respiratory system. I'll start at the top. All right, so look at the nasal cavity. This is where your nose is. If you look just behind where the black line stops, you'll see your turbinates. They're going to humidify your oxygen. Get your nasopharynx. It's going to be right at the very top of the back of the throat. Uh, next, you've got your epiglottis. This is going to be down uh, past the base of your tongue. Your larynx and vocal cords are basically the um, gatekeeper to the trachea. 
they try to keep foreign objects and substances out of the trachea. You'll see with the blue rings is your trachea. You got an arrow pointing to your right lung. The blue tube inside the right lung is going to be the right primary bronchus. Uh, all the way to the bottom of the page, you got your diaphragm. This is the muscle that moves up and down, and it uh, changes the size of our chest cavity. You get your mediastium. This is going to be the area in between the lungs there. Coming up on the right side of the image, you've got your bronchioles. This is uh, where they split off into like fingers over there. Continuing to move up, we've got our left primary bronchus and the left lung. The smaller uh, image off to the right of the main image in this slide is going to just be a zoomed in view of our arterial uh, wrapped around a bunch of alveoli. This is the site of gas exchange, just something to keep in mind. All right, what two functions does respiration accomplish? All right, it gives us oxygen and it allows us to blow off carbon dioxide. All right, what mechanical problems might impede air movement? Uh, there's many things that can impede air movement as far as mechanical issues go, uh, crush injuries, uh, if you've got a lot of pressure on the chest cavity it can impede the flow of air in and out something more related to trauma if you've got what we call a pneumothorax we covered in an earlier chapter can cause a positive pressure inside the chest cavity that can't be overcome by um, your diaphragm and it'll just cause air to not be able to move in and out all right respiratory compromise Respiratory compromise is defined as any condition that results in the inability of a person to breathe adequately. Hypoxia is the inadequate oxygen supply to the body's cells. This can result in an altered mental status, pale skin, or cyanosis of the nail beds and lips. Just remember cyanosis is a blue color and it often presents in the nail beds and in the lips. All right, um, again, respiratory compromise, any condition resulting in the inability of a person to breathe adequately. This can also cause hypercarbia, which is an excess of carbon dioxide in the blood. It can also be uh, caused by inadequate ventilations. All right, respiratory distress, also known as dyspnea. This is the body's response to respiratory compromise. Your work of breathing is going to increase. Uh, generally, you're going to see an increased respiratory rate and the use of accessory muscles. Patient is generally going to move into a tripod position, which is sitting down, leaning forward. And they may not be able to speak a whole sentence without taking a breath. So you'll see two to three word sentences between breaths. This can quickly progress into respiratory failure if you don't get in front of it. Biggest thing when you see somebody that's in severe respiratory distress, you'll note this during your primary survey or primary assessment. You want to immediately do something to correct that. If I walk in and I see somebody breathing 28, 30 times a minute, they're leaning forward in a uh, tripod position, they can't speak, I'm immediately going to apply supplemental oxygen, most likely in the form of a non-rebreather mask. And go ahead and address their issue and I can figure out exactly what's going on with them later but I want to go ahead and get them some oxygen all right respiratory failure this is gonna be failure of the body's normal compensatory mechanisms and the breathing rate is going to begin to slow down the tidal volume begins to get more shallow you're gonna see somebody possibly develop an altered mental status when you start getting into respiratory failure, this is where you need to start 
uh, correcting their ventilation manually. Most of the time this is going to be done with the use of a bag valve mask. We're just going to be assisting their ventilations. If you've got somebody that's breathing slow and shallow, or rapid and shallow for that matter, you're going to have to address both of those situations. And the best way to do that is with a bag valve mask and supplemental oxygen. This can quickly progress into respiratory arrest. Once somebody's moved into respiratory failure, if you don't get in front of it immediately, they're so fatigued at this point that they can slip into respiratory arrest very quickly. And as we know, respiratory arrest is the cessation or stop of spontaneous breathing. It's a bad situation to get into, especially if you have limited resources. All right, some causes, common causes of respiratory compromise are hyperventilation, asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, exposure to poison or some other substance, or an allergic reaction. All right, do you think it's important to learn what is causing the respir respiratory compromise before beginning treatment? Uh, so the answer to that is absolutely not. Like I said before, when I walk into a room or a location where a patient is in severe respiratory distress, I can tell before I ever make physical contact with them. I can tell as soon as I put my eyes on them. Most of the time, they're going to be in severe distress, and it's going to be easy to see it. And at that initial point in time, I don't care why they're experiencing respiratory compromise. It doesn't matter to me. I want to get in front of that. And I'm going to do that by applying oxygen uh, via non-rebreather mask at a high rate and high concentration. That way we're not delaying um, getting in front of that problem until I figure it out. It could take me several minutes to figure out why this person is having uh, difficulty breathing. And it, the real answer is it just doesn't matter at that point in the game. It, it just does not matter. If they need oxygen, put them on oxygen. We don't care why they're having a hard time breathing. They just are. And our way to fix that is to apply supplemental oxygen. Asthma is a chronic lung disease. Asthma attacks that manifest as acute shortness of breath, usually accompanied by wheezing, may be triggered by infections, allergies, or other irritating stimulants to the airways. Although it is episodic, an asthma attack can be life-threatening as airflow is restricted in one direction. The patient inhales normally. During exhalation, stale air is trapped in the lungs. Contractions and excess thick mucus close down bronchioles, severely restricting airflow. Breathing difficulty is reversed with a metered dose inhaler, which provides a metered or exactly measured dose. Most patients refer to the device as their inhaler or puffer. The inhaler is prescribed for bronchoconstriction, a constriction or blockage of the bronchi that lead from the trachea to the lungs, or other types of lung obstructions. The inhalers contain a drug that dilates or enlarges air passages. Emphysema and chronic bronchitis are chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, disorders mainly of middle-aged or older patients, in which tissues react to smoking, other pollutants, or repeated infections. In chronic bronchitis, the bronchial lining is inflamed, excess mucus forms, and cells are unable to clear away accumulations because the cilia are damaged. In emphysema, the walls of the alveoli break down, reducing the surface area. The lungs lose elasticity and stale air laden with carbon dioxide is trapped in the lungs. Care for all respiratory conditions is similar. Do not withhold oxygen. The need outweighs the risk of administration. You need not diagnose a condition to provide effective treatment. Constantly monitor the patient. If breathing becomes inadequate, assist respiration through artificial ventilation and obtain medical direction. All right, so normal breathing. All right, normal breathing is sufficient to support life. It's going to be easy and effortless. They'll be able to speak in full sentence without having to catch their breath. So normal breathing for an adult is going to be at a rate of about 12 to 20 per minute. For a child, it's going to be 18 to 30 per minute. An infant is going to breathe at 24 to 40 times per minute. And a newborn will breathe at 30 to 60 times per minute. 
These ranges are very important to keep in mind, especially when you're dealing with your infants and your newborns. They breathe really quickly. Sometimes the faster an individual is breathing, the harder it can be to actually count their respiratory rate. Just know that infants and newborns breathe a lot faster than adults and even children. Our respiratory compromise continued. Uh, we're still talking about normal breathing as it relates to tidal volume. The amount of air in each respiration is considered the tidal volume. It should not be too shallow or too deep. Just watch the chest rise and fall. Make sure you're getting adequate tidal volume. All right, normal breathing continued. Um, work of breathing is the effort it takes for a patient to move each breath in and out. It should be effortless in normal breathing. Respiratory pattern should occur at regular intervals and last for the same amount of time. If you're seeing somebody that's just breathing more erratically, different tidal volumes, different rates, there's, there's probably going to be a problem. All right, let's talk about abnormal breathing. Now, this is not sufficient to support life. Uh, it can include respiratory stress, respiratory failure, respiratory arrest. Uh, keep in mind the differences between respiratory distress, failure, and arrest. Respiratory distress is when somebody's having a hard time breathing, but they are able to manage, maintain their airway. Respiratory failure is when the muscles of breathing begin to fatigue and the patient's respiratory uh, the things they've been doing to compensate are failing this is where we're going in respiratory failure that can quickly lead to respiratory arrest which is the stop or cessation of spontaneous breathing so you can also just have a increased worth of breathing uh, you're going to see them breathing it's going to be difficult and their breathing is going to be labored alright here's something to think about if respiratory compromise can lead to respiratory arrest, what can respiratory arrest soon lead to? All right. So, respiratory compromise can lead to respiratory arrest. What do you think respiratory arrest can lead to? The right, answer is going to be cardiac arrest. Uh, that is just because if you're not moving air and oxygen in and out of the body, eventually everything is going to stop and your heart is going to not have any oxygen to be able to continue to function and it's going to stop as well all right let's talk about abnormal breathing some more uh you're going to have early on an individual is going to have an increased respiratory rate later you're going to see a decreased respiratory rate this is when they're going to be starting to move into that respiratory failure so increased respiratory rate is they're compensating well. As that rate starts to go down, their compensatory mechanisms are starting to get fatigued and they're not going to be able to continue. All right. Uh, respirations that are too deep or too shallow. Irregular breathing rhythm. Like I said before, if somebody's breathing irregularly, generally there's a problem and a lot of times that's going to be something wrong with their brain. If you can hear audible breath sounds to include gurgling, gurgling noises generally are going to come from the upper airway. They can be frequently from vomit, they can be from blood, they can be really from any liquid. Uh, sometimes you can hear some gurgling sounds in the lower airway. It's not really going to transmit into the um, area that we can hear it without assistance but you would call that ronchi it would just be a more loose gurgling sound in the larger airways you can hear snoring this is something that's pretty simple to hear i know we've all heard people snore before if it's because they're unconscious after an injury or a illness something we need to address wheezing if you can hear somebody wheezing audibly without assistance of a stethoscope you're um, going to want to think about, do they have asthma? Do they have COPD? 
However, our treatment for them, as far as the EMR level, is going to be exactly the same. We're just going to apply supplemental oxygen. We're going to relay the information we've gathered to the responding paramedics and allow them to take uh, the treatment a little bit further when they get there. All right, let's talk about the tripod position. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, tripod position is going to be seated or standing with hands on the knees or some other surface. Shoulders are generally going to be arched upward and the head is going to be forward. Uh, accessory muscles, these are going to be muscles of the neck, which would include your sternocleidomastoid muscles, your chest, which would be your um, external and internal intercostal muscles. Also the abdomen, and they're going to assist during uh, periods of respiratory difficulty. Uh, cyanosis of the nail beds and lips, as we talked about before, signs of respiratory compromise, as well as the altered mental status and abnormal pulse rate. All right, so what is the purpose of the tripod position? Right, when we're in class, we'll go ahead and, or actually we can do it right now. Wherever you're sitting at, let's get you guys to slouch in the chair and just kind of bend over, observe your breathing. Uh, lean forward and just observe your breathing. Do you feel like you might not be able to breathe quite as well? All right. Go ahead and sit straight up. Lean forward just a little bit. Raise your head to the air. Put your hands on your knees and breathe. Are you, are you able to breathe a little bit better sitting like that? You definitely should notice a reduction in the effort you're breathing. All right, so why would a patient suffering from respiratory compromise experience an altered mental status? All right, so they're not getting enough oxygen to your to their brain. You've got to have oxygen for your brain to be able to function appropriately, and if you start becoming hypoxic, you're going to have some changes in mental status. Sometimes they can appear as if they're almost drunk. Now, this is an image of an individual sitting in the tripod position. Um, on the image, it's got a lot of things listed. These are all going to be signs and symptoms of respiratory compromise. So just keep in mind they can have an altered mental status. They can feel dizzy, faint, or restless. You can see a blue coloration known as cyanosis. You'll see their neck muscles straining as well as their facial muscles sometimes. They'll occasionally have a sharp stabbing pains in their chest. They can have numbness or tingling in the hands and the feet. You may notice their nostrils are flaring. Their lips may be pursed together. Coughing, crowing, or a high-pitched barking noise may be heard. If you look at his abdom abdominal muscles, they're strained and sucked in. All right, now we're going to get into some specific disease processes. Now let's get started with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. Most common cause is going to be a history of heavy cigarette smoking. It may be hard to distinguish COPD from heart failure. Uh, chronic bronchitis, which is the same as COPD, and emphysema, uh, they're generally going to be on home oxygen if, they're, if they've been diagnosed and they're being treated appropriately. Sometimes they're not. A lot of times you'll come to people who are not diagnosed yet. All right, this is just an image of a woman. Looks like in her home, she's got an oxygen concentrator here. So... The oxygen concentrator will take room air that we're breathing and it will purify it to a more uh, pure form of oxygen and she can adjust the flow rate that's given her supplemental oxygen that she's always on probably for COPD or emphysema. All right, let's continue with bronchitis. Uh, it's going to be swelling and thickening of the bronchi and bronchioles. You also have an overproduction of mucus in the airways. Chronic 
Bronchitis is characterized by a productive cough for three or four consecutive months and occurs at least two consecutive years. Uh, signs and symptoms. Most people with COPD tend to be overweight. They can have just a mild to moderate shortness of breath just in sitting without supplemental oxygen. They generally are going to have a pale or bluish complexion. Uh, they have a productive cough most of the time. You'll also be able to hear wheezing when you listen to their lung sounds. Emphysema. It's a lung disease caused by permanent damage to the alveoli. Alveoli become useless in the exchange process of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So these alveoli are going to be pretty flaccid. They're not going to fill appropriately. Uh, they just have way too much stretch in them. And when you don't have the ability to decrease the thickness of that membrane and fill them with the air, you're just not going to have adequate gas exchange. They're also going to have a decreased lung elasticity. It's characterized by trapping carbon dioxide. You have an accumulation of air and the chest wall will be extended over time causing the look of a barrel chest. That's something you can do to kind of simulate CO, the feelings of COPD would be to get like a drinking straw and just breathe through the straw see how it feels you're going to have a restricted ability to move air in and out uh, the most difficult part is going to be the blowing air out part and that's something that will really give you the feel for what somebody with COPD is breathing like all right, so somebody with emphysema is going to prevent, uh, present with moderate to severe shortness of breath. They're generally very thin in appearance. They'll have a large barrel chest as well. A lot of times they have a non-productive cough just because they don't have the increase in mucus production. You'll see extended exhalations. They have a hard time getting out air. And you also see pursed lip breathing which is them holding their lips close together while they're exhaling most of the time. All right, so purse lip breathing, um, like I said, the patient will hold their lips tight while forcing his exhaled, exhaled air out. This increases the exhalation phase and causes back pressure deep within the lungs. Uh, this is believed to assist with keeping the alveoli open and promoting gas exchange. All right, this is a normal alveoli. Uh, so as we know, emphysema affects the alveoli and bronchitis affects the bronchioles. We're going to go ahead and look at a couple images of emphysema affected bronchioles and alveoli as well as bronchitis affected. All right, so this is somebody with emphysema. If you'll take a look at it, uh, it's got a decreased surface area inside the uh, alveoli. Um, just causes them where they're not able to have an adequate gas exchange and they also have a hard time getting the air out of their body. If you look above the alveoli, it's got a lot of mucus in there. That's generally not something that you're going to see with emphysema um, not really sure why they have that in the image but they do all right this is going to be um, bronchitis you'll see that there's mucus plugs as well as inflammation which makes their lumen or the inside of the bronchial much smaller and increases the resistance to air All right, asthma. Asthma is a lower airway disease. It's caused by the sensitivity to irritants such as pollen, pollutants, and exercise. 
The bronchioles are going to spasm, constrict, and produce excess mucus. Narrowed air passages cause wheezing. High-pitched whistling may typically occur on exhalation. Asthma causes the bronchioles to narrow and fill with mucus. If you look at the center bronchiole, you see a mucus plug in there. And you also see mucus accumulation at the bronchiole on the right. And you also see edema, the bronchial lining, similar to COPD or bronchitis. All right, signs and symptoms of asthma are going to be monitor, uh, moderate to severe shortness of breath. This is typically not constant. This will be just during an asthma exacerbation. You're going to hear wheezing. The individual will become anxious, which is going to be because of the lack of oxygen being supplied. And they frequently have a non-productive cough. Right, asthma patients are going <clears> to <throat> have little or no symptoms between attacks. Medication generally comes in a meter dose inhaler. This is going to be a small device that stores and delivers medication that a patient inhales into the lungs. In your role, you want to encourage the patient to take their medication exactly as it's prescribed and also get them to check the expiration date. And why do you think some asthma suff uh, sufferers wait and to call EMS until it appears to be too late? All right, so many asthma sufferers experience attacks frequently, frequently and are often able to gain control of the attacks by self-medicating with their pre prescribed medications. Sometimes their attack is going to rapidly progress. They're not really expecting that, and paramedics are going to be needed. All right, so what information can the EMR be ready to provide to EMS in the verbal report for patients <clears throat> prescribed a meter dose inhaler? Uh, you can tell the paramedics when they arrive, hey, this patient has taken uh, several doses of a meter dose inhaler. Uh, just tell them all the information about what's going on, how long it's been happening, and how many doses they've actually given themselves. Alright, a severe asthma attack may lead to respiratory arrest and even death. <clears throat> now, this is absolutely true. I've come in contact with many individuals that have just waited too long to call 911. They think they can get their asthma attack under control. They try and they fail. And by the time they call us, it's just they're in a bad situation. I frequently have to intubate which means uh, put a tube down someone's trachea with asthma and give them a bunch of different types of meds to try to get in front of this attack and sometimes if they wait that late even that's not going to fix it <clears throat> so you've got to just when you see it you've got to get in front of it and try to stop it from getting any worse Right, this is a meter dose inhaler. They're pretty common. Most of you guys have probably seen one before. All right, this is a meter dose inhaler with a spacer. This is good, especially for children who may not be able to coordinate inhaling at the same time they're delivering the medication. And this leaves them a little bit more room for error. And it's, like I said, frequently seen in children. All right, hyperventilation syndrome. <clears throat> now, this is going to be characterized by rapid, deep, uncontrolled breathing. It's going to result in excessive elimination of carbon dioxide. If you remember from your previous chapter, blowing off a bunch of CO2 is going to increase your pH, making you more alkalotic. This is going to put us into what we would call respiratory alkalosis. It's most commonly caused by an emotional response or some type of anxiety. It may also be caused by a serious medical emergency such as a myocardial infarction. Guys, I went into the 
respiratory alkalosis and blowing off of carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide a minute ago. I think that's going to be a little bit deep for this class, so it's not bad information to know, but you can just kind of brush over that. That's something we'll cover more deeply in the EMT portion of this class. All right, so why would a serious medical condition such as a myocardial infarction lead to hyperventilation? All right, so patients suffering from a myocardial infarction may feel a sense of impending doom, which is frightening and can lead to hyperventilation and anxiety. That's why I always tell people just because somebody appears to be having an anxiety attack, you can't dismiss it as, oh, they're just having an anxiety attack. They're fine. You've got to be able to figure out the root cause of the anxiety attack, and frequently this can be a myocardial infarction. So you're going to treat hyperventilation uh, syndrome as respiratory distress event. Until you prove otherwise, this is going to be a true respiratory event or a cardiac event. You're going to pay attention for cyanosis. Monitor the changes in the patient's vital signs. You want to try to reduce anxiety by reassuring and comforting the patient. Uh, moderate to severe short shortness of breath can generally occur. You'll also see associated anxiety, numbness or tingling in the fingertips, lips, and or toes, dizziness, spasms of the fingers and toes, and also you can see chest discomfort. All right, so how can an EMR tell if someone is having a true respiratory emergency or is simply hyperventilating due to anxiety? All right. So you always want to treat all patients with respiratory distress as a true emergency, regardless of the underlying cause. When hyperventilation is going on, focus on calming the patient down in a reassuring, comforting manner. But you're also going to do the same treatment that you would for somebody that you believe is in a true respiratory distress situation. Never withhold oxygen from a patient that's experiencing shortness of breath, regardless of what you think the cause is. All right, pulse oximetry. <clears throat> pulse oximetry is a measurement of the saturation, oxygen saturation in the patient's blood. Normal range is between 94 and 99%. A pulse oximeter is a simple, used to a simple tool used to monitor saturation. It's most commonly placed on the finger, and it also monitors the patient's pulse. Uh, take note that the pulse displayed on a pulse oximeter is only accurate if there is good pulsatile flow and the patient's pulse is regular. If you've got an irregular pulse, a pulse oximeter for the heart rate itself is going to be useless. This is just an image of a pulse oximeter. You can see the top number is displaying the SpO2, which is the uh, name for pulse oximetry. Below that, you get a heart rate. The heart rate is going to be 80. Let's get into the emergency care of respiratory compromise. The first thing you're going to do is assess the responsive patient. You're going to observe their body language, determine the characteristics of their breathing, pay attention to the level of distress and their facial expression. You also want to reassure the patient. You're also going to gather a history, uh, determine if they're able to speak clearly and in full sentences. Listen for sounds as the patient breathes. Uh, a lot of times you're going to be listening for those wheezing sounds that we were talking about, as well as more higher pitched upper airway sounds. All right, so if you've got an unresponsive patient, you're going to confirm or establish an open airway if needed. You're going to determine the rate, depth, and work of breathing. Provide positive pressure ventilations for inadequate breathing. If you need to assist their breathing, you're going to use a bag mask device. Place the mask firmly over the patient's face. Provide rescue breaths at the rate appropriate for the patient's age. All right, this image is uh, showing two providers providing rescue breaths to this patient. They're using a bag mask device with supplemental oxygen. 
And so you're always going to take appropriate BSI precautions. You're going to perform a primary assessment. You're going to support the ABCs. You want to ensure the patient's airway. Administer oxygen per your local protocols. You're going to allow the patient to maintain a position of comfort. Arrange for ALS response if it's available. In this county, there is always going to be an ALS response. All right, in what position will the patient experiencing respiratory distress most likely be the most comfortable? Um, this is going to be saying we're on a stretcher, and the answer to that is going to be Fowler's position, which is sitting straight up. All right, so you're also going to assist with prescribed medications per local protocols and medical direction. Now, that's something we're going to need to get with uh, the medical director for the county discuss uh, you guys being able to assist with medications or not. I'm going to continue to monitor patient and provide reassurance. Providing reassurance is huge. You just want to make sure that they know you're there, you're helping them, and if they do have an anxiety component in here, a lot of times that can help relieve it. This is an algorithm for emergency care of patients in respiratory distress. <clears throat> All right, so you find somebody in respiratory distress. We're starting on the left. You're immediately going to provide supplemental oxygen. You want to keep the patient at rest and reassure them. If the patient has medication, uh, you can assist with the meds if appropriate. If they do not have medication, just monitor ABCs and vital signs. Continue to uh, give them that supplemental oxygen. And you're going to do a reassessment until more help arrives. All right, let's think about it. <clears throat> you're treating a patient with severe respiratory distress. You notice his or her respiratory rate is slowing down. Is this a good sign or a bad sign? Uh, well, that's a difficult question. So if they were having... Respiratory distress that could be, you know, an anxiety reaction that could be a good thing. They could be calming down and their rate could be slowing down. In general, it's a bad sign, though. Uh, if you've got somebody that's having a hard time breathing, they're having a hard time breathing, they're compensating, compensating, eventually their muscles are going to become fatigued and they're just not going to be able to keep up with the compensation anymore. And the first sign that they're decompensating is going to be a decreased uh, respiratory rate. And their tidal volumes are also going to become more shallow. So in general, this is going to be a bad sign. How would you tell the difference in that? Um, you always want to treat everybody with dyspnea as if it's a true respiratory emergency. Um, in your role, there's really no way to necessarily tell the difference and you want to continue to just treat them uh, would your observation warrant updating the responding ambulance absolutely if you see somebody and you can tell they're decompensating uh, you're going to want to let those paramedics know what's going on that way they can be prepared to take some aggressive action and get that patient's breathing under control when they arrive they could also provide you with some information and some different techniques that you may be able to manage that patient's breathing. All right, let's go through a summary of this chapter. All right, respiratory compromise is one of the most common causes encountered. Some causes include asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, and hyperventilation. It's characterized by increased work of breathing increased breathing rate and the use of accessory muscles. Left untreated, it can lead to respiratory failure, respiratory arrest, and death. Asthma is a disease of the lower airway and is characterized by spasm and swelling of the bronchioles, resulting in narrowing of the airways. It can be triggered by allergies, dust, stress, and or exercise. Bronchitis is the inflammation of the bronchi and bronchioles. Results in an overproduction of mucus, over the inside lining of the airways. This may last for months at a time and it's generally characterized by a productive cough. Emphysema is a loss of lung tissue, elasticity, and destruction of alveoli. 
It's going to result in poor gas exchange and trapping of excess carbon dioxide within the lungs. It's a slow progressive disease <clears throat> that results in severe respiratory distress eventually. Hyperventilation syndrome is mostly associated with situations of high stress or anxiety. It begins with the stress of situation caused by causing the patient to breathe fast. If not controlled, it will result in loss of too much carbon dioxide. Usually treated by helping the patient keep calm and control the breathing. However, never withhold oxygen from these individuals. Always assume that there is some type of legitimate cause aside from the anxiety and the stress you're not going to hurt them by applying oxygen and assuming the worst if it's happens to just be an anxiety attack it's great but we don't want to withhold oxygen until we're you know because we're not sure uh, care is going to include support of the abc's providing supplemental oxygen calming and reassuring the patient Allow the patient to maintain a position of comfort and do not force the patient to lie down unless they are unresponsive. Rapid transport by ALS ambulance is most appropriate care for severe respiratory emergencies. If available, encourage the patient to self-administer prescribed metered dose inhaler as it is prescribed. Right, what are some common causes of respiratory compromise? Uh, some of the big ones are asthma, COPD, emphysema. What are the signs and symptoms of a patient experiencing respiratory compromise? Biggest one you're going to see is an increased respiratory rate. You may also uh, hear some wheezing or other airway noises, but the biggest early sign is going to be an increase in respiratory rate. As you progress with that, you can see fatigue as it moves into failure. You can see a slowing of the respiratory rate as well as the tidal volume. That's when you really need to start getting concerned. And why is it important to recognize the fear that respiratory emergency can cause? All right, so it's important because the fear can cause someone to have an anxiety reaction. And this can further increase the respiratory rate. And you have to know that just because somebody is having an anxiety reaction, sometimes this anxiety can be caused because they feel like they can't breathe or they can't breathe. So you have to understand there's a component of fear associated with respiratory or cardiac emergency that can lead to anxiety reaction. And just because they're having any data reaction does not mean they're not having some other type of emergency as well. Now, what is the appropriate assessment and care for a patient experiencing respiratory compromise? All right, so first and foremost, you've got to do your initial primary assessment. After you do this and you determine they're having some symptoms of respiratory compromise and need immediate supplemental oxygen, generally... If I've got somebody and I can obviously tell they're having a hard time breathing like that, I'm going to apply oxygen in the form of a non-rebreather mask at a high flow rate and a high concentration. This is going to go ahead and address the issue they are most likely having. Even if I think it's an anxiety attack, I'm still going to place them on supplemental oxygen. It's the right thing to do. Anxiety reactions can be caused by cardiac issues or other respiratory problems. Always apply the oxygen, even if you think it's just some type of hyperventilation syndrome. After you've done your treatment, you want to keep them reassured, try to keep them calm, try to prevent them from becoming any more hypoxic. Just keep them at rest and wait on more help to arrive. Alright guys, this is going to conclude chapter 15. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me.